This is wrestling's greatest moments. Hey now, wrestling fans. It's time for another episode of Wrestling's Greatest Moments. The 1980s have often been called the second golden age of tag team wrestling due to the abundance of awesome teams. However, the 1970s weren't wanting for greatness. Sit back as Wrestling's Greatest Moments looks at 7 Super 70s Tag Teams Part 1. Before we get started though, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a single video. The Criteria These teams may have competed before or after the 1970s, but their heyday was in the 1970s. They also worked during the Territory Era, a distinct difference from the 1980s teams we've covered in other videos who worked during the Territory and National Eras. While many wrestlers worked in different territories to stay fresh, some didn't because they were always top draws. Consequently, a team only working in one region isn't necessarily a sign they weren't as good as teams that found success in several promotions. The essential elements are whether the teams could draw, with championships often being a sign promoters favored them. Note, there are many other Super 70s tag teams besides these seven, and rest assured, we'll be looking at more down the road. The Valiant Brothers Johnny, Jimmy, and Jerry Kayfabe brothers Johnny, Jimmy, and Jerry Valiant maintained a notable presence in the WWWF at different points in the 1970s. However, Jimmy and Johnny's WWWF run was undoubtedly their most successful one as a tag team. Jimmy entered the WWWF in 1971 as babyface Chief J. Strongbow's tag partner, but turned by betraying Strongbow. According to the book WWE Legends, Jimmy met wrestler John L. Sullivan in the World Wrestling Association. Jimmy was so impressed with Sullivan that he offered to make him his tag team partner in the Indianapolis-based WWA, where he was competing at the time. John L. Sullivan became luscious Johnny Valiant, bleaching his hair blonde like his brother and taking on the same obnoxious attitude. They won the WWA tag team title in 1974, beating the formidable team of San Martino and Dick the Bruiser. Success continued in the WWWF, where they defeated Tony Guerrilla and Dean Ho in 1974 for the WWWF Tag Team Championship, reigning for a record-setting 370 days. A record which stood until the late 1980s, when Demolition held the WWF Tag Team Championship 470 days. Captain Lou Albano managed Johnny and Jimmy, just one of many tag teams he led to the top. Another kayfabe brother, Jerry Valiant, entered the scene in the late 1970s after Jimmy Valiant was reportedly sidelined with hepatitis. Johnny and Jerry defeated Larry Zbysko and Tony Gurria for the WWWF Tag Team titles in 1979. Johnny and Jerry's title run wasn't as long as Johnny and Jimmy's, but at 230 days, it was still impressive. Mr. Fuji and Professor Toru Tanaka Although younger fans only know of Mr. Fuji's work as a tuxedo-clad manager, he had several solid runs as WWWF and WWF Tag Team Champion. Mr. Fuji's sinister alliance with Professor Toru Tanaka led to the team holding the WWWF Tag Team Championship three different times, an extraordinary feat that wouldn't be repeated until the Wild Samoans run in the early 1980s. Behind the scenes, Fuji was well known as a jokester, and even more as a river, but in the ring both men were all business. Tanaka was close to 300 pounds, and Mr. Fuji was no beanpole reportedly weighing around 270 pounds. The two Hawaiian wrestlers portrayed sadistic Japanese heels, capitalizing on wrestling's still thriving formula of matching foreign villains against baby faces. According to five-time WWWF and WWF tag team champion Tony Gurria, Fuji was a wizard at getting heat, and Gurria also credits Mr. Fuji with helping him hone his wrestling skills. He always had so much heat, even if the memories of the war were starting to wear off by then. I think even in the 60s, people still thought, if you're Japanese, you're an evil person. Once it reached into the 70s, it started to slacken off. But Fuji was a businessman and was playing a role. He was a family man, really. The Grand Wizard guided the Fuji Tanaka team to the WWWF Tag Team Championship twice, in 1972 and 1973. While Freddy Blassie led them to WWWF Tag Team Gold in 1977, According to Freddie Blassie, Fuji and Tanaka had an uneasy partnership. The two certainly had no great admiration for each other. Tanaka was a by-the-book guy who looked at wrestling as a means to make a living. He wanted to work his match, shake hands with everyone afterwards, and save some money. He was a professional. Classy Blassie claims that Tanaka was the team's anchor and ring general. 
If you wanted to talk about an angle beforehand, you always went to Tanaka. He was the ring general, who would lead everyone else in the match. Fuji was certainly a good performer, but you couldn't control him. So, in addition to worrying about their opponents, Tanaka had the responsibility of making sure that Fuji didn't get out of hand. Despite any differences, the Fuji Tanaka team was a force to be reckoned with in the WWWF and beyond, including title runs in the Continental Wrestling Association, Georgia Championship Wrestling, and Southeastern Championship Wrestling. Their first WWWF tag title run lasted nearly a year, a sign of how much they drew fans to arenas. The Minnesota Wrecking Crew Fans who grew up in Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling a.k.a. Jim Crockett Promotions and Georgia Championship Wrestling, know the name Anderson was synonymous with violence. Lars, Gene, and Ole Anderson, none of them real-life brothers, made up the collective known as the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. But Gene and Ole are the best-known pairing of the Brutal Brothers. Gene and Ole set the tone for all their matches, with opponents finding themselves in work shoots where the Andersons made their opponents fight to make a tag and exchange some stiff blows. The Andersons also developed their signature style of targeting one of their opponent's limbs for the entire match, until it was kayfabe useless. Ole and Gene held tag team titles in Georgia and the Mid-Atlantic area, including the Mid-Atlantic area's version of the NWA World Tag Team Championship. Gene and Ole battled a who's who of tag teams, including Mr. Wrestling 1 and 2, Johnny Weaver and George Becker, Paul Jones and Wahoo McDaniel. And as we'll see, the Anderson's kayfabe cousin, Ric Flair, and his partner in crime, Greg Valentine. The Dream Team, Greg Valentine and Ric Flair. Many tag teams have used the name The Dream Team, including Greg Valentine and his WWF Tag Team Championship partner, Brutus Beefcake. In this case, both Flair and Valentine were two single stars on the fast track to success, whose love for hurting opponents led to a fast friendship, and as often happens, later erupted into a feud. Greg, the son of Johnny Valentine, was brought to Mid-Atlantic Wrestling to take over when his father's career ended in the plane crash of 1975. See our video, The Deadly Plane Crash That Nearly Ended Wrestling, for more details. Flair had learned a lot teaming with Greg's father, Johnny, and working with Greg seemed like a natural follow-up. In his memoir, To Be the Man, Flair describes what Greg brought to the team. When we teamed together, I did most of the talking, while he was the quiet guy who definitely carried a little bit of that Valentine mystique. We were a good pair. He dressed nicely and knew how to represent the business. And he was accepted in the dressing room not because of his name, but because he established his own identity. With talent almost as big as their egos, both grapplers were known for talking trash, and on one occasion, it led to one of the area's most heated feuds. When Ric Flair began taking offense at his cousins, the Andersons, sparks flew. And soon, the Flair-Valentine duo were at war with the Minnesota Wrecking Crew. This battle of the bullies, as Mid-Atlantic fans dubbed battles between heels, led to the Dream Team doing what very few teams came close to doing, let alone achieving, defeating the Andersons for the NWA World Tag Team Championship. Mid-Atlantic had always been renowned for its tag team division, and the Dream Team faced numerous teams. Here's just a smattering as detailed by Tim Hornbaker in his exhaustive work on Flair, the last real world champion. The tag team picture in the Mid-Atlantic Territory was robust, and the new champions faced combinations of Steamboat, Jones, Wahoo McDaniel, Tiger Conway Jr., and Ole Anderson before the end of the year. The team ended when Greg Valentine left for the WWWF. When Valentine returned to the area, Flair was a babyface, and Valentine launched a feud against the Nature Boy. While the two would team up later occasionally, their heyday was over. Blackjack Lanza and Blackjack Mulligan Good guys may wear black, at least if you were Chuck Norris in the 1978 film of the same name. But Blackjack Lanza and Blackjack Mulligan's all-black attire, boots, vest, tights and cowboy hats symbolized bad things were coming. Once the two big men, billed at 6'5 and 6'9 respectively, stepped into the ring, there was no doubt babyfaces were in for a tough night. The Blackjacks began their team in the AWA under the guidance of Bobby the Brain Heenan. While they didn't win AWA's World Tag Team Championship, they struck gold in the WWWF with Captain Lou Albano's help. Lanza and Mulligan debuted in the WWWF in 1975, wrestling WWWF Tag Team Champions Dominic DiNucci and Victor Rivera in a non-title match. Things immediately picked up when Captain Lou Albano showed up at ringside and began helping the heels during the match. 
This led to a wild brawl between the champs and the heels, and Albano's revelation that he was now managing the Blackjacks. Some reports suggest things got so heated that police were forced to use tear gas to calm the unruly group of fans. The Blackjacks secured title matches as wrestler Pat Barrett replaced Victor Rivera. The new champions fought off the Blackjacks until they lost the belts during an August 26, 1975 taping of Championship Wrestling. Lanza and Mulligan won the belts in a two out of three falls match. While the Blackjacks' reign was less than three months, they were an impressive team. The two also held Big Time Wrestling's NWA American Tag Team Championship and the WWA World Tag Team Championship. Sadly, the Blackjack success was not to last. According to Blackjack Mulligan, most tag teams are one weak guy and one strong guy, not two main eventers. Lanza and I were two main eventers, which was hard to keep as a team, explained Mulligan. Usually, a team is formed by a weakness of one who's an undercard guy, who's a great talent that's never going to make it big, and this other great talent that pulls the team along. But they complement each other together. We were main eventers, so we didn't really hold the longevity that we should have because we split. Mulligan traveled to Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, teaming with heel Ric Flair and winning the NWA World Tag Team Championship. Lanza returned to the AWA, winning the AWA World Tag Team Championship with another villainous cowboy, Bobby Duncombe Sr. The Blackjacks reunited briefly in 1983 and 1984, appearing in promotions including the NWA St. Louis Wrestling Club, Central States Wrestling, and the AWA. Mr. Wrestling 1 and Mr. Wrestling 2 At a time when masked wrestlers were typically pushed as villains, perhaps a subscriber to J. Jonah Jameson's Masked Menace philosophy, Mr. Wrestling and Mr. Wrestling 2 defied the norm, playing two baby faces. Tim Woods, aka Mr. Wrestling, teamed with Mr. Wrestling 2, John Walker, forming a solid tag team that battled various heel teams in the South. Interestingly, Walker was all but retired from the squared circle when he was asked to return, this time under a mask. The masked gimmick was a smash hit and Mr. Wrestling 2 enjoyed singles and tag team success. United States President Jimmy Carter and Carter's mother, Lillian, were both fans. As recalled in a 2020 obituary on Mr. Wrestling 2, Lillian Carter became a fan due to politicking for her son. She says she started going to matches in 1966 while campaigning for her son the first time he ran for governor. Lillian claimed she initially went just to shake hands with potential voters, but she was hooked. Miss Lillian's favorite wrestler? Wrestler number two. He wears a mask. Wrestling lore has it that Mr. Wrestling 2 was invited to Carter's inauguration. However, Mr. Wrestling 2 declined when he was asked to remove his mask. Nonetheless, he later scored a visit to the White House, and there's an iconic picture of Jimmy Carter placing him in a headlock. As for the team, Mr. Wrestling 2 was called in to fill in for Mr. Wrestling, with Wrestling 2 distinguishing his white mask from Wrestling 1's with black details. The two later teamed, winning tag team titles and feuding with heel teams, including legendary masked heels, The Assassins, the Minnesota Wrecking Crew's Gene and Ole Anderson, and the fabulous Freebirds. Mr. Wrestling 2 would describe what worked for the team. We complimented each other very well. Timmy was much more the consummate wrestler. I was kind of what you would call the hot-headed guy. It gave us an edge as far as the tag team was concerned. Behind the scenes, the two became good friends, with historian and reporter Mike Mooniam writing in 2011. Walker and Woods became best friends as well as solid wrestling partners. It's strange how things work out, says Walker. We made a good team and we got along fantastically. Timmy and I were closer than brothers. That didn't stop promoters from booking a feud between the two. As noted in Greg Oliver and Steven Johnson's book, The Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame, The Tag Teams, the team fractured when Mr. Wrestling 1 agreed to challenge NWA world champion Jack Briscoe on the condition that he wrestled without a mask. Mr. Wrestling 2 was upset by what he saw, feeling it tainted the mask tradition, and he interfered in the match, costing Mr. Wrestling 1 a possible win. The feud continued through the early part of 1974, ending as Mr. Wrestling 2 drove a symbolic axe into a piece of wood on a TV show, effectively burying the hatchet. Like many of these teams, the wrestlers found greater success as single stars than tag team wrestlers. Nonetheless, Mr. Wrestling and Mr. Wrestling 2 were a dominant force in the 1970s. Nick Bockwinkle and Ray Stevens Although Ray Stevens enjoyed single success in various promotions, he was a wrestler that tag team success came to easily. 
Stevens, best known for his Blonde Bombers team with Pat Patterson, also found fame in the AWA as tag team champion with Nick Bockwinkle. With Bobby the Brain Heenan by their side, success seemed guaranteed, but that wasn't the case initially. Nick Bockwinkle, who was beginning to make a name for himself as a single star, was floundering in the AWA. That changed when the promotion decided to team him with veteran wrestler Ray Stevens. The duo had three incredible runs with the AWA World Tag Team Championship, with their second run lasting 561 days. Like several of the wrestlers on our list, Bockwinkle would utilize his tag team experience and channel it into single success. In his case, several runs at the AWA World Heavyweight Championship. Stevens traveled to Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling, winning its version of the NWA World Tag Team Championship with Jimmy Superfly Snuka and later Greg Valentine. After a run in the WWF, Stevens returned to the AWA, reforging his team with Bockwinkle. Do you remember these Super 70s tag teams? And if so, what do you think of them? Don't worry if your favorite team wasn't mentioned, because there's more to come. Share your thoughts in the comment section, and let us know if there are any videos you'd like wrestling's greatest moments to cover. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel, follow us on X and Instagram, and spread the good news about wrestling's greatest moments the channel that celebrates the squared circle.